to Brian Lee? Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask Brian to come up and talk about his kindness project, but maybe we'll do that. Mm. So today we are going to continue in our sermon series, um, The Gospel According to the Avengers. I said to uh, one of my colleagues the other day that that was our sermon series here at St. Paul. This was the response, no freaking way! <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, don't you watch the Avengers and find them to be filled with theological nuggets that we all can take? Well, of course, but I would not even think about showing that at my church. <laughs> like, well, then, dude, come to ours. <laughs> but today we're going to talk about the Hulk, right? I happen to think that the Hulk is the most misunderstood um, one of the Avengers because A, he doesn't have a fancy suit to put on. B, he didn't make the choice to be the strength that he is like Captain America did. C, he wasn't born with natural strength like, um, like Thor was because he's not a god. He becomes an Avenger reluctantly or uh, an Avenger of reluctantly because of the fact that he had a lab accident. And in that lab accident, he becomes a person who has two natures. The lab accident allows that nature inside of him that gets angry and rage-filled to come out. What I, tell you, what I can tell you is without doing much of a spoiler, it gets better for the Hulk. <laughs> As the movies go on, it gets better for the Hulk. But I can remember being a child who sat at home and I waited for the Hulk to come on television with Lou Ferrigno, right? And he had on the great big huge sponge nose that made his nose bigger and you could tell that it was a painted green sponge, but we didn't care because that was such a powerful kind of television show for us to watch. I remember a boy telling me when I was in school at that age that I couldn't like the Hulk because I was a girl and I wasn't allowed to like the Hulk. But I wanted to talk today about some of the things that the Hulk goes through in being an Avenger because some of it he willingly does and some of it he doesn't really want to have to do. And it was spurred in my mind to talk about those sorts of things when I heard um, a couple, three stories in this last week about the growing rage in our country. So the first clip that Steve's going to show you is a clip that's really short. It's only about a minute long. <clears throat> and it's from the movie The Avengers. And it's where the Hulk is transforming. And it's a, it's a part of the movie where you realize that he's suffering because he's transforming. So let's just watch that quick clip really quick. So you can see in this clip that he's struggling with that rage that he feels inside of him. In this particular clip, he's been manipulated into transforming into what they're calling, you know, amongst themselves, the beast inside of him. He didn't want to feel that rage, but all of a sudden something triggered that rage, and the rage just comes up in him, and he can't control it. Have you ever had one of those days? when the rage just comes up and you can't control what's going on inside of you. I often tell people that if I'm shouting, if my voice is loud, I'm just angry. Because my habit when I get filled with rage is to become very quiet and to then begin plotting your demise. <laughs> Fred laughed back there. But that's, that's the truth. That's the way that I learned to process rage. When I'm, when I'm just like flinging something or I'm, I, my voice gets really loud about something, I'm just simply angry and all I need to do is get that out. But if the rage button gets hit inside of me, I become very quiet and very analytical and very calculated, and that's when you want to back slowly away from me, right? I don't have that as much as I used to have that. Um, but I do remember, uh, there's gonna be a scene in here and you'll, you'll understand when I say this. I do remember saying to someone, much like the Hulk says, you have found out I'm always angry. I'm always angry. I've been able to transform that. But what I'm really concerned about is the fact that our world doesn't seem to be able to, con to transform how it's getting angry. I'm gonna tell you three stories. I'm gonna start with, out of the three, the most 
simple stories of rage that I've heard in the last three weeks. Anybody here ever been to Disney World? <laughs> you know that Disney World can be a little trying sometimes if you're not in that, this is the most magical place in the world mindset when you walk in there. Did you all hear the story this week about how a Chicago girl punched a Disney World employee in the face because her fast pass wasn't working? Can you imagine that? And, and the reason why she punched the girl in the face at the ride was because she went up to the ride and her fast pass wasn't working, so she started messing around. The girl that, that did the punching started messing around with the controls, which could have put hundreds of people's lives at danger, in danger. I don't, I don't know how many people ride on the Tower of Terror because I don't ride it. <laughs> but but there, were, there was the potential that people's lives were in danger when this girl who was angry started messing with the controls of the ride because she felt like that was okay for her to do. And when the Disney employee who did something they are never supposed to do, touch another person, pushed her hand away to make her stop, the girl just hauled off and punched the Disney employee in the face because her fast pass wasn't working. The girl needs some anger management classes of some sort. Um, uh, it's hot in Florida. <laughs> but let me tell you, these are gonna, these things are gonna get progressively worse as we hear how rage is growing. So did you hear the story about the little girl who thought her friends were walking her to the CTA red line? She thought the people around her were her friends and they were helping her get to the CTA red line because she has some sort of either physical or mental disability. I haven't been able to discern which it was. Um, they get her outside and they just start beating on her. And somebody thought it was you know, smart and prudent to videotape it. Thank God they, the voyeurism took over there because that's the only way that they have found out who assaulted this little girl. I could never imagine, no matter how angry I would have been at one of my friends when I was 15 years old, punching them, hurting them, harming them in some way like that. I may have been rage-filled in planning their demise, but I never acted upon it. <laughs> punching in the face at Disney, beating up the little girl at the bus stop, and then did you hear the one about the man who carjacked a car in Philadelphia? So I don't agree that carjacking is right in any, <coughs> in any way whatsoever. I don't agree that it's, it's any good. Mom has three children in the back of her car. She decides that she wants to pop into the pizza shop where the dad of two of the little children are working. She leaves the car running. She leaves the children in the back of the car. Carjacker comes up, carjacks the car, takes off with the three little children in the car. Now, every mom or every auntie or every dad or every uncle or anybody who's ever been responsible for a child knows what that fear is to realize that your child is in danger, right? So he carjacks the car, the mom and the dad run out of the pizza shop, they run after the car, the car gets stopped in traffic, and so the guy decides to jump out and just abandon the car um, because he stopped in traffic and he knows he's gonna get caught, but they catch him. They catch up with him. And the dad starts wailing on him, which I would imagine that any dad probably in the world would have done. But a mob of men in the streets come up and they start pounding on him and he died. They beat him to death because they could not put their rage in such of a place that they could just hold him down until the cops got there. What has America become when I hear more stories of rage in the world than I hear of how we are helping one another? That's one of the reasons why I wanted Brian to come up here and introduce his project that he's working on because Brian, um, Brian Sly, who is Heather Sella's boyfriend, he is developing an app for us to keep track of how many good deeds we do during the day, how many times we're kind to one another in the world, to try and get the idea of kindness going forward in this world. Because obviously, it doesn't take very much from us to look 
out into our world to see that we are being conformed to this world, which is what the Apostle Paul was trying to teach the disciples in Rome not to do. When he says to them, don't be conformed to the world. Do not be like the Romans. He's trying to teach them. Don't be that, that person who is angry and taking everything that you want and forgetting about everybody else. He's trying to teach the disciples to be, con be transformed by God's love and to be different. But I think that it's pretty obvious in our world that what we're seeing around us is everyone is being conformed to the way the world works rather than being transformed to work the way that the kingdom works. Now, I will readily admit to you, I'm, I get a little road rage because I'm usually in a hurry and I want to be wherever I'm at. But yesterday, Steve and I were almost in a very serious accident coming home because somebody next to us did not want to stay where they were in their lane and I had to slam on my brakes doing about 65 miles an hour down 94 out of Milwaukee so that the car, their back end, wouldn't hit my front end because they simply could not stand that they were in traffic. And as we were driving along and incredulous about what had just happened to us, we saw that car weaving in and out, in and out of all the other cars. Within less than 60 seconds, we couldn't find the car anymore because it was gone. We didn't know if it had moved that fast through the traffic or if it had gotten off on the traffic, but if it had gotten off on the ramp, why was it cutting me off in the left lane? So it must have went straight as we were going. Those instances are growing in this world. And just think about it. If we're angry and we're in this big, huge, thousands pound vehicle, it becomes a weapon. Every time we get in our car, if we're angry, we have just created a weapon to be used in the world. Those are the little things. Think about the big things that when you're so angry that you would beat someone to death in the streets. What can we possibly do in our world to help change that? What can we possibly do to try and reverse some of this divisiveness and hatred that keeps coming up in our world? Do you know that I could go back through all of my prayer requests and we pray for the divisiveness and the hate in our nation almost every single solitary week? We pray for that because we realize that the people in this world are being conformed to it rather than transformed for the kingdom of God. I'm going to show you the next clip, which is another scene where the Hulk comes out, but it's wholly different than the last scene. So what we learned from that clip right there when Dr. Banner says, that's my secret cat, I'm always angry, is that we always have a choice of how to use our anger. We either use it for good or we use it for evil. Remember last week we talked about the evil that is among us? Sometimes we are the evil because we cannot simply control how we're going to use our anger. Imagine what could have happened if that mob that was hurting that man in the street because of his bad action, if that mob would have grown to be focused on something other than just that man. If it would have grown, if somebody else would have said, hey, I'm going to run over there and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, all of a sudden that mob would have been out of control and that there could have been other deaths in the street. But what we learned from the Hulk right there is this, is that there is a way for us to channel our anger into positive change in this world. But we have to be willing to allow it to change us that way that we can do the positive with it rather than constantly using it for power, for the power that it gives us. Don't you feel a little powerful when you feel angry? Do you know that psychologists tell us that anger shuts off the stress hormone inside of our bodies, cortisol. And it raises, especially in men, testosterone, but it also raises our heart rate and it raises um, our desire to get close to people. 
Because when we get angry, what we want to do is we want to take the power that it gives us and we get closer to people rather than moving away from them. So our choice is always, if we're angry and we want to get close to someone, how are we going to use that closeness for positive, peace-filled things in this world? Now, I really want you to think about that. Think about the times that you've had an argument with your spouse, right? I've learned that when I have an argument, I have to walk that direction, right? But Steve would tell you that when I was younger, that closest thing was really because wherever he went, I was following him and I was screaming and I was pointing my finger down here and I was trying to get as close to him as possible because I was going to power him down. I had to learn that my anger needs to walk away. We're doing a really poor job in our world of having our anger pulled back so that we can do positive things, have a channel toward that. But what we see is this growing, conforming to the world of our anger wanting us to get close and be able to power over people. I said to the group that I met with on um, Tuesday night last week that throughout my ministry I've come to understand one thing. And that is, is that everybody in this world is seeking power. Everybody wants to be powerful. They're seeking out, how can I have power over other people? Because we've conformed enough to this world to believe that if we don't have power, we are worthless. And what the scripture teaches us is, is that being powerless is the position Jesus asks us to be in so that we can be filled with true power. Yet we still crave and want to be so powerful. We want to be the ones on top all the time. What you'd realize about Hulk if you had seen all the movies is, is that he is always shunning his power. He's really truthfully the most powerful one of them next to Thor. But he's always trying to get away from it. He's always trying to keep it under wraps, to use his anger to channel towards finding good scientific um, options for us to use in the world. Yet many of us are not able to do that in this world. Many of us choose to get closer and go for our power than we choose to back off and become less filled with power. When the Apostle Paul is talking to the disciples in Rome and saying to them, don't be conformed to this world, be transformed by the power of God, he's saying to them, back up. Allow yourself to become a little powerless so you can become power filled in this world. Back up. Step back. Use what you're feeling to change the world positively. But we still haven't gotten that message all these thousands of years after Paul has written that. Because what do we do sometimes when we realize that somebody around us is filled with peace? We call them names. They're just hippies, you know, the hippies and their peace movement. We call people who are centered and calm and never seem to get angry in our midst, people that are woo-woo, wacko. We say those things about people who show peace. Because power, power is so addictive. And we want it. Our task always is to ask ourselves, am I being conformed to this world with what I'm feeling and what I want right in this moment? Or am I being transformed to be in the kingdom of God? And that is a daily task, as I prayed in the opening prayer of this message. It is a daily task for us to ask ourselves, is what I am doing right now world-like or is it kingdom-like? And we, if we want the kingdom of God to come as we pray every single solitary week, thy kingdom come, we have to start stepping back and becoming kingdom-like and letting our need for power dissipate. And it's very, very hard. 
I like the Hulk because he struggles with that every day the same way that we all struggle with it. He doesn't want the glory that Tony Stark <coughs> wants. He doesn't want to be seen as the great Avenger as Captain America does. He doesn't want the power to command the lightning and the thunder like Thor has. The Hulk steps back, trying to find a different way. And when the Apostle Paul asks us to be transformed for the kingdom, he's asking us to try and find a different way. That's really hard. Amen.